I'm Salvatore Babonis, and today's lecture is The New Economic Geography, China in the Millennial World System. The globalization era that began in the 1990s seems to have played itself out. Uh, after decades of rapid rising flows of trade and later foreign direct investment, these seem to have leveled off since the global financial crisis. Between 1970, at the left side of this graph, and 2008, the global financial crisis, global levels of trade as a percent of global GDP roughly doubled from less than 30% of global GDP all the way up to 60%. Uh, there was a similar, though much more volatile, rise in levels of foreign direct investment, uh, graphed on the right axis as a percent of global GDP. The period of most rapid globalization ran for about 17 years, from 1991 to 2008. Yet since 2008, both series, trade and investment, have been stagnant or falling. Now, of course, there was the very sharp decline of 2009 with the global financial crisis. But even though both trade and investment bounced back up from that decline, they've been stagnant or falling as a percent of global GDP ever since. What we're left with is a global economy of about 75 trillion US dollars in GDP that instead of being evenly spread around the world has actually become highly concentrated in a few narrow uh, geographical zones of the global economy. Uh, first, North America with 29% of global GDP. Second, Western Europe with 24% of global GDP. And finally, East Asia with 23% of global GDP. The entire rest of the world, South America, Africa, the Middle East, the former Soviet Union, uh, South Asia, including India, Southeast Asia, uh, Australia, you know, that entire remainder of world is less than 25% of global GDP. What's more, if you take just the BRIS countries, Brazil, Russia, India, and South Africa, forget about China for a minute, think of the four large developing countries that are not uh, integrated into global supply chains, but are instead cut off from the global economy, these four countries together, despite the fact that with China they were considered you know, the leading economies of the globalization era, in fact, they're way down at around 7% of global GDP. Um, China is rather larger and carries the BRICS grouping up with it, uh, but China is very different from the other large developing countries in that China is closely integrated into an East Asian uh, production network, whereas the rest of the world's uh, global south um, is not really connected into this larger global economy. In fact, if we zero in on each of these leading uh, zones of the global economy. First, North America. Slightly over 50% of total trade in North America is actually intra-regional trade. It's trade among the United States, Canada, and Mexico, the NAFTA countries. Uh, now, NAFTA may or may not be renegotiated by the Trump administration, but the fact is that North America is a single, very closely integrated uh, production network. It, it, the supply chains of North America um, really are mostly turned in within North America, and that becomes even more clear if you were to disaggregate the United States. I mean, after all, 87% of the North American economy is in one country, the United States of America. Imagine if the United States were disaggregated, so that just like in Europe, we thought of you know, trade between the East Coast and the West Coast as trade. You know, right now it's, it's not captured in international trade statistics. Imagine if it were, then we would find that the integration of the North American economy would be far more than 50% of all trade would be within the zone. The North American uh, part of the global economy uh, is in fact the best integrated and I think the most uh, closely integrated zone in terms of governance of the entire global economy. After all, you know, the vast majority, 87% of the North American zone, 
is governed under a single set of laws with only minor state-by-state -state differences uh, within the United States. Contrast that to Europe. Uh, in Europe, 69% of all trade is intra-European trade. That is, European countries mainly trade with each other. But there's only weak political integration of the core of that zone. I mean, the European Union is the main governing body of international or, or of, of the economy in general in Europe. Uh, even countries that are not members of the European Union have to follow uh, European Union rules if they want to be integrated into the European economy. This is uh, the big debate over Brexit. Uh, it, when the UK leaves the European Union, to what extent will it still be governed by European Union rules simply because it's part of Europe and it wants to export to Europe? Um, but you know, the European Union's uh, coverage of the, of the European economy will fall down to 78% once Britain does leave. So it, it'll still be the behemoth of Europe, but it will no longer be um, the only game in town in Europe. What's more, the European Union's level of political integration is much weaker than that of the United States. Obviously, the United States is a single country, even though it has 50 constituent states. Virtually all economic governance is conducted at the federal level, whereas the European Union um, still contains you know, 20, uh, 28 uh, countries that each have their own economic policies that can be very different from each other. In East Asia, there's similarly a high degree of intra-regional trade. Most of East Asia trades with other countries within East Asia. And just like in the North American case, if you were to unpack China, you know, China is, is the 800-pound gorilla of East Asia. If you were to unpack China into separate regional economies and include trade among Chinese regions as part of intra-regional intra trade, you would find that uh, East Asia is also you know, very highly integrated, just like Europe is. But here, although there is full political integration of a two-thirds part of the zone, you know, two-thirds of the East Asian economy is in China, so it's in one country, that country has very poor economic uh, governance. So in East Asia, we see um, only a smaller part of the zone covered by one set of rules, the Chinese part of East Asia, and those rules are not anywhere near as robust as the governance mechanisms in place in the United States or even in the European Union. So what we have here are three zones of the world economy that trade mainly within themselves. And we all use the word globalization to mean um, you know, some kind of world is flat connection of everybody with everybody else in the world. But from an economic standpoint, we haven't really seen globalization. We've seen a regionalization of the global economy into three distinct economic regions. And everywhere else, that remaining 23 or 24% of the global economy is very poorly integrated with uh, these larger zones. And it, they're not integrated with each other. So uh, Brazilian trade is not oriented uh, towards the other countries of South America. It's oriented towards Europe, China, and the United States. The same is true of trade in Australia or trade in India or trade in South Africa. These are all countries that mainly trade with the three major economic zones of the world, uh, they are not countries that mainly trade with their neighbors. And that's really distinctive. Uh, there are three integrated zones in the world, and then there are in another you know, 120 countries or more that are poorly connected to those three leading zones. What's more, these three leading zones uh, are not created equal. Um, there's a very strong hierarchy. And if you think about it, we usually graph the world with uh, Europe at the center, North America off to the west, and you know, China off to the east. But if you start looking at travel times by sea, from North America to Europe is about 10 days in a container ship. From uh, Japan or China to California is about 15 days in a container ship. But from China and East Asia to Europe, the so-called one belt, one road routes across Eurasia and by sea uh, between China and Europe, 
are about 30 days by container ship. So in economic geography terms, it's wrong to say that America is in the west and China is in the east. In fact, in economic geography terms, North America is at the center, Europe is in the, is in the east, and Asia is in the far west, far off the west coast of California. And in fact, integrated production networks really confirm that. The, the Asian production networks, the most famous you know, products coming out of Asia, the electronics, the, the uh, mobile phones, the, you know, even the software, uh, is all very closely integrated into the California, into the American economy not closely integrated into the European economy. From an economic standpoint, when you're in China, you're in the far western outpost of America, you're not in the far eastern outpost of Germany. One Belt, One Road uh, as a policy in China is meant to produce better economic integration in Eurasia, you know, between China and, uh, and Western Europe, better integration between these two secondary zones of the world economy. The problem is simple geography. These places look close on a map, but in economic terms, the distances are enormous because most freight is carried by sea. Um, if you take that freight and build railroads and put it across land, it takes 20 days for trains to get from China to Western Europe. So even a train trip from China to Western Europe is slower than a sea journey from China to California. What's more, that train trip costs three times as much. So it's again, in terms of time and money, it is more distant to connect China with Germany than it is to connect China with California. Not only is North America at the center in terms of trade networks, North America is actually much richer than the other two zones of the world economy. Now, it's difficult to compare different parts of the world economy because you know, different regions are different sizes and you know, we can't always make direct comparisons, but some very broad comparisons make this clear. For example, in North American terms, Germany, the leading economy of Western Europe, the, the, the economic driver of the, Euro, of the Eurozone and of the European Union, has the same GDP per capita, roughly speaking, as the US state of Alabama in the Deep South. Japan is even poorer. Japan is at the level of Mississippi. Now, it may be hard for you to think of you know, Germany with its, uh, you know, beautiful cities and, and its very high quality of life, or Japan with its you know, amazing Shinkansen trains, it may be hard to think of those countries as being on a par with the US Deep South. But, uh, it, but once you start measuring things in statistical terms, instead of in uh, you know, traveler's terms or vague impressions when you visit someplace, uh, in statistical terms, these e e equations are actually uh, very well, uh, very well measured. And you know, if, if you want to grasp that in some intuitive sense, think that you, you know, well, in Germany they have you know, lots of you know, very modern uh, infrastructure and fantastic trains and beautiful cities. Well, but in Alabama, you know, many people have a very large house with you know two big pickup trucks with you know six-cylinder engines that guzzle gas and. I may not prefer the Alabama model to the German model, but that's just my own personal preference. Um, people in Alabama can you know, afford to have lots of house space, lots of land, lots of cars, lots of boats. And just because Alabama consumes different kind of things in Germany, Mississippi certainly consumes different kinds of things from Japan, doesn't mean that, there, that the things consumed in Japan and Germany are actually worth more. Um, statistically speaking, GDP per capita, the total amount produced divided by the total number of people in Germany is simply on a par with Alabama. And in a way that makes sense because if you think about it, you know, manufacturing in the United States um, fled 
Michigan and New York and moved to places like Alabama and Mississippi uh, in the 1960s uh, and 70s. Uh, you know, today, the Deep South, Alabama, Mississippi, Tennessee, is the manufacturing hub of the United States. Well, what about Germany and Japan? I mean, these are very highly, these are economies that are very highly dependent on manufacturing exports. There's a reason why nobody manufactures in New York uh, or Michigan anymore, and that's because New York and Michigan are too rich to support manufacturing industries. Well, Germany and Japan are not too rich to support manufacturing industries. And in fact, instead of seeing the existence of manufacturing as you know, something that is somehow positive for an economy, a better way to see it is to think you know, the richest places in the world are far too rich to bother manufacturing. That's why there's, there's no manufacturing in Silicon Valley. There's no manufacturing in, uh, in you know, Sydney, Australia. There, there, there's no manufacturing in London. Uh, these places are just far too developed to have manufacturing. Japan and Germany are still far enough behind that it is economically possible to manufacture in those countries. Um, in fact, if you start disaggregating the United States and viewing it as an economy of regions, think of California. California is a region that's you know, similar in size and population to Japan. It's not quite as big as Japan in population, but you know, they're in the same league. California could be its own country. Well, California, if it were its own country, would be twice as rich as Japan. That is, the GDP per capita of the state of California is 200% of the GDP per capita of Japan. Now, that takes a little bit of you know, reorienting your mind to get around that really Japan is the Alabama of California. That is, Japan is the poor manufacturing center for the rich, sophisticated economy of California. And in the same way, you know, Germany's GDP per capita is only about 100, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the Northeastern United States uh, uh, GDP per capita is 70% higher than that of Germany. And that's not just because Germany includes its poor eastern zone or what else. Uh, the Northeastern US, the area running from Virginia to Maine, again, could be a country of its own. You know, it's, it's an area of you know, 40 million people. Right? It's, a, it's a, a very large chunk of the global economy. And that northeastern United States running from Virginia to Maine has a GDP per capita that is 50% higher than Bavaria. And Bavaria is the richest state in Germany. Right? So even comparing like for like, rich areas for rich areas, um, the northeastern U.S. is still 50% richer than the very richest state in Germany. So I think this helps contextualize just how far ahead North America is. And of course, we can see it in many other ways as well. Um, you know, the, the end of globalization, I mean, there was a period of rapid change in the world from 1991 through 2008. Then we had the global financial crisis. And this graph shows market capitalization of stocks on stock exchanges around the world. Before the global financial crisis, Europe did not have quite the corporate wealth that the United States had. This is the European Union's uh, corporate uh, stock market capitalization, $4.8 billion a trillion dollars versus America's $5.2 trillion before the global financial crisis. Since the global financial crisis, the global world has taken shape. Not the globalizing world of 1991 to 2008, but the new configuration that we live in post-financial crisis. In this world, more than 60% of the total market capitalization of global stock exchanges is concentrated in the United States. If you were to throw Canada in, you know, you'd probably be up around two thirds of global stock market capitalization being in North America. Right, we've seen this separation of North America from the rest of the world in corporate terms. And this is not just dominance. It's, it's not just that, you know, U.S. stock markets have continued to rise. Well, while European stock markets have been stagnant, it's also dynamism. Think for a minute, what are the top 
new economy companies in the world. If you think what are the top companies, you get all sorts of you know, old dinosaurs like Saudi Aramco oil company or Sinopec in China, the oil company, uh, you can think, or Exxon in the United States, you can think of these huge industrial and resource companies. But nobody thinks that companies like Sinopec and Saudi Aramco are the companies driving the future. If you try to think of the companies driving the future, they're overwhelmingly based in the United States. And you know, here's a, a graphic that just illustrates this. These are the uh, top market capitalization of companies in, in, uh, in, in uh, the world, uh, not just the United States, but in the world. And you know, if you go back 15 years ago, uh, the only tech company that was in the top five was Microsoft. And let's face it, Microsoft is not necessarily the most innovative tech company in the world. Today, in, in, you know, yesterday in 2016, the five top companies in the world by market capitalization were Apple, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, Facebook. Right? Five US-based tech firms. And this little infographic really says it all. It shows that the North American economy has become the dynamic center of the global economy around which the rest of the world revolves. This isn't necessarily because the United States is uh, you know, so magnificent or Americans are so productive or have all the good ideas. In fact, many of the good ideas that you find in America come from foreigners who move to the United States to develop their ideas because it's the center of the global economy that they want to be a part of. Um, so from the BRICS countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, from Europe, and from the global south in general, you know, India, Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, people overwhelmingly, I'm sorry, talented entrepreneurial people overwhelmingly choose to move towards North America, not to Europe or East Asia, uh, but to North America to develop their companies and to, uh, as a place to fully develop their skills. They also want to invest in the United States, and this is particularly facilitated by capital flight. When people get their money out of places like China and South Africa and India, it overwhelmingly goes to the United States. The, the only uh, other country it goes to uh, is the United Kingdom, and that's uh, mainly a recipient of Russian capital flight. Um, in fact, if you look at the top five countries for capital flight, for human flight, you know, for immigration, of skilled migration, the countries where people want to send their children to go to school, um, that's the United States, and then the closely aligned countries of the Anglosphere, the United Kingdom, Canada, Australia, New Zealand. Um, rich Chinese are not sending their kids to go get educated uh, in Germany or Japan. They're sending them to the Anglosphere and primarily to the United States. And that's what brings you images like this. This is uh, one of my favorite internet memes. It's a uh, Chinese graduate at Harvard Business School, a certain member of the global elite holding in the air the two most important symbols of his life on his graduation day, uh, you know, his patriotic uh, flag, People's Republic of China, and the almighty dollar, the, the US one dollar bill. Right? And this says it all, that this person may be Chinese and may be very patriotically Chinese, but he's, developed, he's, he's paid for a degree in the United States, He's developing his talents in the United States, and he's very likely to invest his money in the United States uh, rather than leave his savings accumulating in China. You know, he embodies, the, or symbolizes certainly, the flows of people and capital from China and other uh, parts of the world to the United States. Right. So when we look at this map of the world, what we really see is one zone, North America, with the United States as its center, as by far the richest, uh, by far the best politically integrated uh, zone of the world economy, by far the zone where you know, people from the rest of the world want to move, uh, and also the zone at the center, uh, meaning that uh, the United States is closely connected to Western Europe, 
and the United States is closely connected to East Asia, but Western Europe and East Asia are not closely connected to each other. Now the big question is, what does this mean for China? The only place on you know the only place in the world, the only place in this map that has the potential to disrupt these patterns is China. Well, China right now is 15% of global GDP, more than the rest of the BRICs put together. Right? So China uh, is really like the, uh, overwhelmingly the largest developing economy in the world, um, but it is embedded in the poorest and least well integrated of the world's three major economic regions. It's embedded in East Asia, not directly embedded in the North American economy. Thus, as China moves up the value chain, it's primarily moving up the East Asian value chain, uh, not up the global value chain. Right? It has to conquer East Asia metaphorically, economically conquer East Asia before it uh, moves on to taking over in the larger world. And that's going to be a problem because China, um, with no disrespect meant to, to uh, anyone in the country is governed by a highly corrupt, I think everybody knows that the, the government in China is highly corrupt, party state in which the Communist Party, a single uh, political party, um, fundamentally influences all aspects of economic planning and development. It limits personal freedom, but at a, you know, more importantly for the st from the standpoint of economic development, it limits economic freedoms. Uh, the party, through for political considerations, tells state-owned banks where they should invest. Now, they may do a good job of that. Uh, they've certainly done a better job of that than similar governing parties in other developing countries in the world. Uh, but I don't think anyone believes that if you want to have a, a rich, highly developed economy, the way to do it is to have a uh, political party decide where investment will go and what companies will prosper rather than having a free market make those decisions. Also, uh, the, the lack of political accountability in China results in problems like its enormous levels of air pollution. Um, China has been unable to solve these sorts of problems of public goods like clean water and clean air, um, in large part because it's impossible, uh, well, it's not impossible, but uh, it, government doesn't have to be responsive to its citizens. Um, it, government tries to keep uh, um, unhappiness among its citizens down to an acceptable level, but China is not ultimately a country in which uh, the government answers to the people. Instead, people live to serve uh, the government and serve the country. And as a result, many of them simply leave. <laughs> China uh, has, uh, you know, over the last uh, 30 years, uh, sent 2.2 million, uh, I'm sorry, uh, 2.2 million students uh, to go study in the rest of the world. Only 1.2 million have returned. Right. I mean, the top Chinese talent flees the country to work elsewhere because you know, why should you work somewhere where you can't breathe the air when you can go work in Silicon Valley you know, or in Sydney or London or Boston or you know, somewhere else where you can have a clean and safe environment. In fact, the numbers of Chinese moving overseas is large and rapidly rising. Uh, and if you try to break down the the streams through which Chinese families are moving overseas, and, and these are numbers of families, not numbers of individuals. These data in this graph uh, show the number of people getting a bridgehead, you know, getting some kind of visa, which then can be used to bring uh, spouses, children, you know, can be used to bring other people over with them. Uh, you see that uh, th these are indicative numbers. None of these numbers are, are uh, available in hard, uh, exact counts. They're all available in you know, roughly indicative numbers. 
Um, and you see that they're, they're concentrated in the Anglosphere. Canada and Australia are two of the main destinations for Chinese skilled migration. Uh, even though Canada and Australia are much, much smaller than the United States, they attract similar numbers of uh, skilled migrant visas, ju just a little bit under the US. So if you put it all together, um, you know, most years there's you know, something around 100,000 relatively elite Chinese establishing bridgeheads in the outside world. But that is about to change. Uh, since late 2014, Chinese citizens have been able to get a 10-year tourist visa to visit the United States. Um, prior to that, uh, it was well known that Chinese women who were pregnant had a lot of trouble getting visas to travel to the United States uh, because the United States has jus soli citizenship, meaning that any child born in the United States is automatically uh, eligible to be a citizen of the United States. So it was U.S. immigration officers often would deny a visa to a Chinese woman if she looked pregnant. Thus, before 2015, uh, if a Chinese woman was pregnant and wanted to have the child in the U.S., she often had to you know, immediately get in a plane the minute she found out she was pregnant, but before she was actually showing the pregnancy. It, it created very difficult logistics. Um, you know, women would have to uh, you know, try to get pregnant, you know, reserve the pregnancy hospital in the U.S., and then you know, the minute she knew she was pregnant, apply for a visa. Today, none of those games are necessary at all. Uh, today, a Chinese woman can graduate from a university, uh, still be single, get a 10-year U.S. tourist visa, um, wait around you know, until she's 27, 28, 29 years old. The average age at first uh, birth in China is now similar to that in developed countries, so around age uh, 26, 27 years old. Um, so she can wait until she's 27, 28 years old, and married, and then gets pregnant, and then wait until the fifth or sixth months of her pregnancy, um, and then get on the plane and go to California to have the child, because she already has the visa. As a result, the numbers of Chinese women going to the US to give birth uh, is in the process of rising. It's, it's impossible to get data on this, but indicative data suggests that up until 2014, it was around 10,000 women a year, and that in 2017, it might reach 80,000 women. Uh, and it might rise, because uh, women who just got their 10-year U.S. visas in 2015 and 2016 might not go to the U.S. to have children until 2020 or 2025, because the whole point is there's no rush for them to do it. Now, in the context of China with 1.4 billion people, this may not seem like a lot, but with 100,000 families a year, and this may rise to 150 or 200,000 families a year, establishing a connection in the US, there's the potential over the long term, over the course of the 21st century, um, literally for several million relatively rich, middle class, talented, educated Chinese uh, to emigrate from China to the US. And when they emigrate, they'll become, instead of Chinese, their children will become Chinese Americans, but American citizens who have assets back in China. In other words, it'll be just as if uh, the Chinese economy was being run by foreign investors. Those foreign investors may have Chinese faces and Chinese names, uh, but they will be US citizens living uh, in the United States. Okay. So where is China now, and, and you know, where is it likely to go over the course of the 21st century? I've been writing about this question for uh, the last six or seven years. And in fact, I had a cover article, and there's me on the cover down there uh, in Foreign Affairs Magazine in 2011, Is China's Rise uh, Inevitable? A debate between me and Arvind Subramanian. Now, who am I? You know, I'm a sociologist at the University of Sydney. Arvind Subramanian is the chief economist of India. Uh, and had previously been a, uh, an economist at the International Monetary Fund. So, you know, little me and you know, really uh, very famous Arvind Subramanian. Um, what I said in 2011 
is that China will likely to continue growing faster than Western countries, though after 2020, its growth will have slowed down, or by 2020, its growth will have slowed down and become much more volatile. And it said after 2020, the Chinese population will start to fall. Chinese growth won't average more than about 3%. China will simply become another middle-income country, roughly on a par uh, with Russia and Brazil and, and Mexico. Uh, Subramanian thought that by 2030, the U.S. will be declining, China will be rising, uh, there will be uh, not even a multipolar world, but by 2030, which mind you is only 13 years away, there will be a unipolar world dominated by China. So Subramanian was just taking the current levels of GDP growth in China in 2010, when China was growing at 10.5, 11% per year. And he said that this is going to continue and by 2030, it's going to be a world centered around China uh, with the United States, you know, a second tier country in a Chinese world. Chinese, China's ascendancy is imminent. Now, I find that a completely incredible assertion. And those of you listening to this can think for yourself, do you really think that in 12 or 13 years, China won't just be a competitor to the US, but in 12 or 13 years, this entire picture I've drawn you, uh, North America at the center, East Asia on the periphery, and China on the periphery of East Asia, will that have completely turned around with East Asia at the center and China at the center of East Asia? I think that not only is that inconceivable in 13 years, but it's inconceivable at any time in the future, at least in the next few hundred years. And a big reason for that is population. We can all argue over economic statistics, but we can't argue very much about demographic statistics. Now, if you think China is going to grow uh, to be uh, you know, just as rich in, as the US in per capita terms, uh, well, that's for an economist to maybe to predict. Uh, what I can tell you is that China's population, which has always been the largest in the world, will soon be the second, the third, the fourth largest country in the world. In fact, by 2030, China, or by, by 2050, and certainly by 2100, by the end of the century, China is likely to be smaller, not just smaller than India. I mean, it's going to be smaller than India any day now, uh, but it's going to be smaller than Nigeria. It might be smaller than Indonesia. Um, there'll be several countries larger than China. And that's because China's birth rate uh, is, uh, fertility rate is extremely low. Um, the fertility rate in China, nobody knows exactly because it's, it's a very political uh, statistic. But most of us estimate that China's fertility rate is somewhere around 1.3, at most 1.4 children per woman. Um, now, obviously, replacement would be two children per woman on average. And in fact, the true replacement levels of fertility are slightly more than two children per woman uh, for several uh, technical reasons. Um, so China has nowhere near replacement fertility. And as a result, China's population is going to drop dramatically over the course of the century. Uh, I'm sorry you can't really see the uh, points on this, but this is today, 2017, and this is 2100. By 2100, China's population is projected to be under 1 billion people uh, for the first time since the, you know, the 20th century. Uh, that is the projection based on official fertility statistics. Official fertility statistics say that China's fertility is around 1.7 or 1.8 children per woman. The real fertility rate uh, is actually, like I said, closer to 1.3, which would give you this kind of scenario of China dropping by half to have a population of somewhere around uh, 700 million by the end of the century. Personally, I think that's much more likely. And it raises the prospect that the Anglo-Saxon countries might actually overtake China in population um, sometime early in the 21st century. Now, we're pretty confident about fertility and population growth in the US and the other Anglo-Saxon countries because their populations are mature and stable and change very little over time. There's slow growth in population uh, due to basically pro-family policies. 
Uh, and there is a high level of in-migration. People want to move to the U.S. China has virtually no immigration and as a result uh, is unable to make up for the lost babies that occur due to low fertility. Okay. In short, China will, quote, get old before it gets rich. And I put that in quotes because it's become a, a, a well-rehearsed maxim of people saying that China has missed its demographic window. Now, I don't think China's missed the window. China grew enormously uh, over the last 40 years. Um, it's just that China started from such a low base that even though China made good use of its demographic dividend from uh, lower fertility rates and uh, you know, having a, a, a productive population, um, there's simply nowhere further for it to go. In fact, China's population is aging rapidly. This is China's population profile in 2017 for men on the left and women on the right. And as you can see, China currently has a large population bulge in their late 40s and early 50s, and a large population of their children who are now in their uh, mid-20s, right? So the two big population groups in China uh, are a large group of people who are in their 50s and their children. Um, both of those groups, of course, are going to age over the next uh, over the next uh, 30 or 40 years. So if we look at 2050, we'll see that the, the, the group that's currently now in their 20s are going to be in their 60s, nearing retirement, and the ensuing generations are going to be much, much lower than the generation of current Chinese students in their 20s. And this can only be reversed if China is you know, the first country in the world that manages to boost fertility rates. Um, in general, fertility rates, uh, as countries develop, tend to go down. Um, maybe China will reverse that, uh, but a two-child child policy certainly won't do it. Um, China would need to have lots of people having you know, three, four, and five children to make up for those who choose to have zero or one child. And there are, first of all, that would be illegal. The, the two-child policy is not an unlimited child policy. Uh, and second, uh, it, there are no signs that people want even two children, never mind that people want uh, three, four, or five children. Okay. So a lot of people said, look, you know, South Korea went from being uh, you know, a poor country to being developed. Why can't China? Uh, you know, why can't China just you know, do what the other East Asian tiger economies have done? And there's some problems with that argument. I mean, first of all, South Korea is not as rich as you might think. Uh, it took South Korea 30 years in, in an economic miracle between 1960 and 1990 to go from being an incredibly poor country to having one third of US GDP per capita. It took it another 20 years from 1990 to 2010 to nudge its way up from one third to one half. Right. So China is still at the point where it's down at around a, a quarter or a fifth of US GDP per capita. Could it get up to one third? Yes, I, I mean, I think that's, that's doable. But once it gets up to one third of US GDP per capita, China would start inching its way up. I mean, it, it would have to, it, it's very difficult to continue rapid economic growth. Once a country gets to a level that's you know one third or one half of that of a developed country, and, and you know, Korea really shows that. If China caught up with South Korea, that would be an incredible accomplishment. But even if China caught up with South Korea, it would still only be about half as rich as the United States. Right. And of course, the other problem is that South Korea accomplished this by exporting its low-wage jobs to China. Right. So uh, a lot of the story of South Korea becoming a rich country was that South Korea, once you know, South Korea went from nothing to one third of US GDP by developing South Korea. But China, uh, South Korea then started inching its way further up the value chain by moving low cost production offshore to China. Japan has done the same thing, Taiwan has done the same thing, Hong Kong has done the same thing. You know, they are continuing to move up the value chain by pushing low cost production to China. Of course, the problem is China is 25 times the size of South Korea. It has nowhere to export its jobs to. As China gets rich, it exports its jobs further west in China. Well, that might be great for people in Shanghai and uh, Guangzhou, but it's still part of the Chinese economy. 
Okay. China would need an entire continent of low-wage workers for China to move up the value chain. You know, South Korea is at, is at a higher place in the value chain because South Korea's low-wage workers are actually located in China. Well, where will China's low-wage workers be located? Um, it's one thing to find a low-wage zone to support the 40 million people in South Korea. It's another challenge to find a low-wage zone to support the 1.4 billion people in China. Okay. Of course, China is perhaps unlikely even to reach South Korean levels of development because it lacks democratic accountability, rule of law, uh, you know, real functioning capitalist markets, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay. If we look at China in statistical terms, the Chinese rich coastal provinces, uh, you know, places like Beijing, Shanghai, the Yangtze River Delta, Guangzhou, Guangdong Province, and the Pearl River Delta, these places have already reached South Korean levels of GDP or are, are coming very close to it. Um, but as you go inland, GDP per capita falls dramatically. And you know, Western China, you know, places like Sichuan Province and Chongqing Province are, are far lower. They're you know, still at a level that's only uh, you know, one uh, eighth or you know, one sixth of South Korean levels of development. Right? So even as coastal China does converge. I mean, if you were to look at the rich zones of East Asia, yes, you would have Japan and you would have Japan and South Korea and Taiwan. But you'd also have Shanghai and Beijing and Guangzhou. Uh, but farther out west, there are the poor zones of China. And in fact, you can see this clearly when you look at where are the fast growing parts of China. Those parts of China that have become rich already are the areas where growth has slowed down to a crawl. So the richest part of China, Beijing, is also the slowest growing part of China. Um, same for Shanghai, is the second gro slowest growing part of China. Then uh, Guangdong province is the third slowest. Right? So as these individual provinces reach South Korean levels of development, their growth has slowed to a crawling level just like South Korea's level of growth. The rapid growth is only occurring in the very poor provinces farther to the west in China. Okay. In short, in today's new economic geography, the highest skilled people are not staying in places like western China to help them develop and converge to California levels of growth. The, the world's most skilled people are instead moving themselves and their families to places like California, while places like Western China or Eastern Europe, for that matter, um, remain behind. And this is a story that you can read more about in my book, American Tian Sha, uh, the, the uh, Chinese Money, American Power, and the End of History. Uh, my book uh, encapsulates this argument, at least with regard to China, and shows how uh, larger global forces are are creating a, a, a system that leaves China uh, as a uh, economic periphery of the periphery. That is, it's in the second tier of the global economy in East Asia, and then China is the low-wage periphery you know, of that second tier. And if you'd like to hear more about developments you know, month by month uh, as I write more about these topics, please consider signing up for my Global Asia newsletter. It's uh, one, roughly once a month, and it is free. You can find a link on my website at salvatorbabonus.com. Thank you for listening and please do consider signing up for the newsletter.